from QM Einstein. That was wonderful. Yes, it brings our mindfulness from our mind to our body. So there are a couple of questions in the break. Um, one was someone who asked about the process of looking into the mind. How do we, what are we looking at? So I, my response was the traditional response, which is that that's for you to discover for yourself, right? The Buddha's path is a path of discovery. The Buddha gave the guidelines, and then the rest of the work we have to do ourselves. But there are some pointers that I could mention, and one is, I mean, sort of like, they call spoilers alert, <laughs> means I'm going to give the answer, but even though you're supposed to discover it for yourself. And we used to have to walk up the mountain, you know, for hours to go to the meditation master and give our answer based on our meditation practice, and then walk all the way down the mountain and meditate some more, and then next week, walk up the mountain a couple hours again and give the answer. And the answer was, no, go back and try again. <laughs> and then we'd get back and we'd meditate some more. And this went on for weeks and months. And that's the traditional process, right, of discovering the true nature of the mind. But since time is short, <laughs> people in Hong Kong are busy, <laughs> then I'll give you some pointers. One is that the true nature of the mind is knowing and awareness, whereas the thoughts are what they call adventitious. That means they come and go, come and go, arise and perish, arise and perish. The analogy is, there are two. One is that the mind is like the clear blue sky, and the thoughts are like the clouds. The clouds are not part of the sky. They come and go, pass by, and then disappear. And what we're trying to discover is the clear blue nature of the sky, which is the analogy for the true nature of the mind, hmm? which in its original nature, its true nature, is undisturbed by the coming and going of thoughts and emotions and all the rest of it. The other analogy that's given is that the mind is like the great ocean, and the thoughts are like the waves. The mind is like the nature of the ocean itself, undisturbed by the waves. So this gives us an idea of where we're going with this. We're trying to discover the calm, clear nature of the mind. And sometimes it's called the luminous nature of the mind. Luminous meaning light. Mm -hmm. So um, next time, in your process of discovery, you can watch out for these pointers and see if it accords with your own experience. Well, the second question had to do with fear, which is a very honest question. Um, and the general guideline is that, yes, it can be a bit scary looking at the true nature of the mind because it's open, it's spacious, it's uncluttered by all the thoughts and activities that we normally are engaged in. These thoughts and activities, in a way, are like a diversion to keep us from looking at what's really important, right? We busy ourselves with this, that, and the other things, so we don't really need to look at the true nature of things. Ah. So we need to look at the habit of the mind to avoid looking at its true nature. It's not only the nature of the mind, it's the nature of all phenomena, which basically is the no-self nature of mind and phenomena uh, on Atman. Hmm? Uh, in the Mahayana tradition, they, they call it emptiness. It's basically the same idea, empty of true existence. 
Now, our own emptiness of true existence, our own no self nature is a bit frightening because we all want to believe that we're going to be here forever, that our self is something durable, tangible, important, right? And when we have to look at our true nature, we don't find an enduring self there at all. We find a bunch of impermanent aggregates. Hmm. So at first, wow, that means letting go of our attachment to self. And we could let go of the body. Yeah, we know it's going to decompose and all that. But the mind, oh, we're attached to our ideas. We're attached to our perceptions, attached to our memories, attached to our hopes and dreams. Letting go of all that can be a bit frightening. So that's because we're trying to avoid reality. So in fact, it's good to get used to that sense of lack. When we get used to that sense of lack, lacking a fixed identity, in other words, a self, a true self, it opens up a whole new realm of experience. Our attachment to self, our fixed notion of self-identity, is what's standing between us and really appreciating the world on its own terms. Appreciating the world as it is in its true nature, the beauty of a flower, the beauty of a cloudless sky, the beauty of a cloudy sky, hey, right? But instead of that, we always have our self in the middle, just like with our deep listening. At the beginning, we can see how the self gets in the way between us and the experience of the true nature of phenomena. So uh, David Loy has a great book about this, uh, the sense of lack and how we try to fill it with all the narratives, all the stories, all the legends about the world and our place in the world, instead of looking directly. But the Buddha's teachings was not to be afraid of the true nature of things. To learn to look directly at the true nature of things will open up, will wake us up huh, to a whole new realm of experience. Now, we're not awakened yet, so we don't know what that looks like. We won't know until we get there, right? What awakening or enlightenment looks like. But starting to let go of our fixed concepts of self, including all the different aggregates. Getting, you know, used to letting go of our fixed concept of our body, right? We look in the mirror in the morning and, oh, yep, still there, right? <laughs> and one of my teachers used to say it's a good thing that we get old gradually because if we got old all at once, we'd all freak out. <laughs> we'd be so upset, right? But it happens gradually, thank heaven. And so we, day by day, get a little bit used to a few more wrinkles, you know, a little more gray hair, right? And so we're attached to all of these aggregates and gradually we learn to let go let go of our fixed expectations, um, thinking that we're always going to be 19 and beautiful. Hmm? So, okay, so much more to be said about that, but it is experiential. This is an experiential process, right? We get, it can't be learned in books. We get the guidelines from the books, but to really understand it, we have to look directly at the nature of the mind itself. It's just like, eating chocolate. Hmm? You could read a book about chocolate from cover to cover, but unless you taste the chocolate, you'll never know the first thing about chocolate. Just words, just concepts. Hmm? So we need to get beyond the words and concepts to the direct experience of the true nature of the mind. Okay, so these are, these are excellent questions. Gee. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, what we're going to look at here now is a little bit more about meditation and mindfulness. And 
it's a little scary how fast time goes, but here we go. Okay, first thing to note is that meditation and mindfulness are really popular these days. Um, it's even on the cover of popular magazines. Time Magazine was the most popular. Uh, it's also been on the cover of Newsweek. It's in the li lifestyle section of every newspaper, especially on Sundays, right? And how to get over the blues, right? New ways to beat the blues through meditation and so forth. How your mind can control or heal your body. Okay. Um, meditation centers are popping up all over the world, even especially maybe in the cities. And this is in response to a demand. It's a market thing. <laughs> so people are so stressed out, they need ways to relieve their tension. And meditation seems to be, for most or many people, millions of people, the most effective tool. Okay, now this opens a whole set of questions about whether Buddhism today is just being used as a kind of therapy. Hmm? We go to a therapist, it costs $100 for a half hour in the States, I don't know about Hong Kong, whereas Buddhist meditation is free. Hmm? At least the monks and nuns are free. Um, <laughs> now, that raises another can of worms, which is the commodification of mindfulness. Now mindfulness has become so popular that it's being marketed under different uh, acronyms, MBSR and all the rest of it. You know, there are various, mm, well, methods or trainings, as they call it, of what's basically Buddhist meditation without the Buddhism part. <laughs> right? So, uh, John Cabot Zinn and many other wonderful people have taken Buddhism and adapted it to a secular society. So they can teach Buddhism without mentioning Buddhism. And it's been, yeah, um, and it's been incredibly popular. It's being used in hospitals and schools and prisons all over the country. Now what's wrong with mentioning Buddhism? There's a taboo against religion in secular society. Right? In Hong Kong and the States and many w countries today, we get 12 years of so-called education, <laughs> which could also be called indoctrination into a scientific concept of the world. The new religion is science, eh? Science is true. Religion is superstition. Yeah. So, uh, and we can't help it. We, were, we learned this at school and... Yeah, all of us are influenced by this perspective, the scientific, or what they call scientistic uh, perspective, right? Um, but then our experience as we start to meditate may tell us something different, something we didn't learn in school. Now mind you, mindfulness and meditation are being introduced into the school system in Australia and in some other places and with great effect great benefits for the children. But in many countries, that is illegal. Uh, private schools in the United States can teach it, but public schools generally cannot. Depends on the principal, the teacher, and so on. Mm. I teach at a Catholic university, so I can teach meditation all I want. And the, the, the Catholic students love it and the students who don't have any religion at all. They love meditation. So, but you don't have that same freedom in a public university, a state university, right? So now this uh, meditation center is in, can we dim that light, please? Maybe get a better picture. It is located in downtown Bangkok. A nun who was a popular fashion model, I mean way popular, and she um, was given six acres of land in downtown Bangkok, and she turned it into a meditation center. And every weekend, thousands of people come and practice meditation together. This was our Sakyadita conference in Bangkok in 2013. So um, you see all kinds of, all the people meditating there. It's a lovely spot. Now, meditation is something that can be practiced by anyone. Uh, it can be practiced by children, by old folks, by 
uh, people who are ill, people who are dying. Um, it can be practiced by people of all religions and no religion. So this is why they refrain from using Buddhism also, not only that it's illegal in some settings and turns people off in other settings, um, but also because it makes it meditation available to people of all different backgrounds, right? Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, secular. Anybody can practice meditation if they, if they call it mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Now, the downside of that, the critique of that, is that in commodifying or making mindfulness into a, a secular practice, they're taking it outside the framework of Buddhist ethics and compassion. So mindfulness can be practiced without an ethical um, foundation such that you can rob a bank mindfully. Hmm? Yeah, look at the, you can kill mindfully. Look at the samurai. Hmm? Samurai were really mindful, and they were really good at slicing people up, right? So, and the other um, piece is compassion. If we practice mindfulness without compassion, where does that lead? So that's sort of the wisdom and compassion thing again. Anyway, so that debate has been raging for about 10 years now, and it will continue. But the bottom line is that mindfulness is helpful. It's been used in hospitals, for example, with chronic uh, and terminal patients, people with chronic pain and people who are terminally ill. And it's had great benefit. So, hey, if it keeps people from suffering, if it saves people from suffering, the Buddhists are happy about that. So, um, all good, all good. Or as, as my Hawaiian friend says, all blessings, all blessings. <laughs> no matter how bad things get, she says, all blessings, all blessings. So, now I'd like to introduce the um, different Buddhist uh, traditions of meditation. And there are more than, there are many, right? As I mentioned, 84,000 teachings of the Buddha, all designed for meditation. But in general, we can divide the Buddhist meditations into two types. And this is two of all Buddhist traditions. Uh, there's shamatha, or calm abiding, and vipassana, insight. So uh, shamatha, or shine in Tibetan, huh? and I think you say jiguan in Chinese. Hmm? OK. And then insight. Uh, or vipassana, which is laktong in Tibetan, or you can say in Chinese, what is the Chinese? Guan. Guan. Oh, so ju guan is the combination, is the yeah combination of shamatha vipassana. And both are said to be necessary for achieving awakening. So let's look first at shamatha practice. Shamatha is often pictured in nine stages. It's explained in nine stages, and it's pictured or illustrated with the elephant going up the path through the nine stages. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been, become so popular, it's also um, written up in some books that you can access. And here is the picture of the elephant. In the beginning, the elephant's mind is all obscured by delusions. Now, I'm not really too keen on this black-white symbolism because, well, in my country, we have a race problem. <laughs> yeah, serious race problem. And so mm, I kind of question the symbolism, but it's in most philosophies and most religions, so we're kind of stuck with it. In any case, <laughs> um, you see the flames of the passions, mm, desire, greed, and all of that. Um, and then you see the monkey, the distracted monkey mind. Hmm? And then later on, you'll see the rabbit symbolizing sloth and torpor. So as we meditate, the delusions of the mind, these destructive emotions, become weaker and weaker. And that's symbolized by clearing out or you know, the white color of the elephant. So now, what are the nine stages of shamatha practice? 
The first four stages are designed for developing stability of mind. It's very important if we're going to do higher meditation practices that we first develop a strong foundation of stability or concentration. So the goal of shamatha practice is single-pointed concentration or samadhi. So the first step is to place the mind on the object. Uh, just as we did, we used first the breathing, and then we used the nature of the mind itself. Later, we used the body, hmm? replacing the mind. Okay. Second is continual placement. When the mind drifts, when the mind wanders, and gets distracted by thoughts and emotions and images and so forth, we continue, continually replace it on the object. Um, I'm sorry, we continually place it, like we stay with the object, okay? And the third one is the repeated placement, okay? Every time it wanders, we bring it back. So placing the mind, then continually placing it, and trying to lengthen the span of our concentration on the object, and then repeatedly replacing the mind on the object. And fourth is close placement. We get so close to the object that we become one with it. Well, just as I think I mentioned, become one with your breathing. Hmm? So nothing comes between you and your breathing. Hmm? Okay, uh, the stages five and six are for developing clarity of mind. So in this, these two stages, we first work on taming the mind, it means subduing the mind, bringing the mind under control. Hmm? And sixth is pacifying the mind, making the mind peaceful. The last three stages, thoroughly pacifying the mind. <laughs> yeah, thoroughly pacifying the mind. Then one-pointedness. Single-pointedness, I think, what's the Chinese? Ding? Ding? You ding? Hmm? Xin ding. Yeah, xin ding. Okay, so, yeah, exactly. Um, and um, Tendai Ji has a really good book about this, right? Um, about Jiguan. So if you've got free time, you can read Tendai Ji's book about this. And of course, uh, now we find many translations from the Tibetan in English, too. So there's more and more material available. And we're so fortunate in this. You know, there was a time when you would have to give up everything and go to some mountain in China to learn this stuff and stay for two years, you know. And uh, it wasn't easy and it wasn't, you know, free always. You normally you have to make some offerings and so forth. But nowadays, there are bookshelves full of instructions on meditation and some very good ones. Of course, we have to be discerning because there's a lot of junk out there too, especially on the internet. But if we are discerning and we find good sources, it's a wealth of information, very helpful. Okay, and the last stage is equanimity. Hmm? Equanimity. So that the mind becomes equanimous in any situation. No matter what arises in the mind, eh, we can handle it. Yeah? And then that tra translates to everyday life when we experience disasters and disappointments, then we can handle, right? Because the mind is used to equanimity. It feels comfortable with equanimity. So here are some uh, close-ups, some details of this uh, picture, this painting, which is often found in Tibetan monasteries. At the beginning, the elephant of wild elephant of the mind is completely obscured by delusions. Hmm? The, the fires of anger and hatred are very big, and the wild monkey mind of distraction is very powerful. Um, the sloth and torpor thing means the mind gets lazy. Mm -hmm. The mind becomes dull. And then we head for the refrigerator. But <laughs> actually, little by little, with perseverance and joyful effort, one of the six perfections, sloth and torpor becomes less, have, uh, less grip over our mind. Okay, so stage by stage, eventually 
the mind becomes purer and clearer in its true nature, right? Free of the, all of these mental defilements and obscuring emotions. Um, the mind is now completely under our power. Hmm? And we are victorious. Victorious over what? Over victorious over the enemies of our own mind. Our enemies are inside, not outside. Um, hopefully. <laughs> I mean, and so here's the general picture. Now, single pointed concentration is a very useful uh, attainment. Once we have single pointed concentration for 20 minutes, we can meditate single pointedly on any object for any length of time. We don't need to, even to eat ordinary food. Hmm? I remember one time I went to Zhou Hua Shan. It was 1982. It was very early. And I met an old monk in a small shrine there. He was 92 years old. He was a very special practitioner. When you looked in his eyes, you saw eternity. You knew he was on to something. Yeah, he had some deep insight. And in my broken Chinese, I started to ask him some questions. It turned out that he had only just come down to Zhou Hua Shan that spring. He'd been living up in the mountains for many years. So I asked him, were you alone up on the mountain? He said, oh, no, there are hundreds of meditators up on the mountain. I said, really? Wow. Didn't the communists come and try to chase you away? He said, yeah, in the beginning they did. But it was too much trouble to catch us. And so they finally they gave up. And they said, if you don't eat the food of the people, you can go. I said, well, then what did you eat? He said, oh, the first few years we ate the bark of trees, fruits, and berries, um, the uh, roots of the plants, and so forth. But after a while, we lived on the food of samadhi. Yeah? Don't cook tonight, right? It means you can live on the power of your meditation. I think everyone who does an intensive meditation course has this experience that, you know, normally we're all locked into our three meals, right? But once you do a lot of meditation, you don't really need dinner. Um, heavy meals actually interfere with our meditation practice, so um, it kind of makes sense. Now, there are many different forms of meditation, and this is one sort of visualization meditation, where you visualize on the form in the tantric tradition of a realized being. And this is also in standard Mahayana as well in the early days. You know that Amitabha practice began with visualization. Mianfo can also mean contemplate the Buddha. But later, it, can, it also was taken to mean recite the name of the Buddha. So, now here let's unpack the four foundations of mindfulness a bit. Um, and, as we learned, the four foundations of mindfulness are body, feelings, mind, and other phenomena, or mental contents. So when we talk about mindfulness of the body, we're talking about being mindful of our breath, our posture. <laughs> Always have to remember to sit up straight. Mindfulness of movement. Mindfulness of physical sensations. How many people have done a Goenka course? OK, this is um, uh, part of the Vipassana practice as taught in the uh, Goenka tradition, Ubakin tradition, but it's also in Mahasi Sayadaw and other Burmese meditation methods. So we will actually do a body scan, being aware of the sensations of the body, mm -hmm. heat and cold, comfort and discomfort, uh, itching, dullness, and so on and so forth. So, now that leads right into mindfulness of feelings. Mindfulness of feelings means being aware of pleasant sensations, 
unpleasant sensations and neutral sensations. Right? Um, the third one, mindfulness of mind and consciousness. So that's what we did this morning. Mindful of our thoughts, mindful of our mental states, mindful of all our emotions, right? And the fourth one, mindful of mental content, means mindfulness of all the other phenomena. You know, the, the table, the, the cushion, the uh, you know, sunshine, whatever. Uh, and also the phenomena that arise in the mind. The phenomena that arise in the mind are also phenomena, even though they are not necessarily substantial. Right? So phenomena don't have to be material phenomena. They can also be men mental phenomena. The image of your mother, image of your father, the image of um, New York or Shanghai, you know, it's your mental content, right? So being aware of all of that. So we develop that in meditation. So what are the benefits of mindfulness? Well, first of all, we learn to embrace all of life's experiences, right? At present, we often shut out unpleasant experiences, boring experiences, and so forth. But when we practice mindfulness, we're mindful of everything, all that is as it is, as the Buddha said. Hmm? That's a good thing, because ordinarily, in the unexamined life, which Socrates famously said was not worth living, <laughs> um, we tend to just focus on certain experiences, right? We have our planner, and we do what's in our planner, and then the week goes by, whew, made it through that one, right? Thank God it's Friday, you know? It's even a restaurant chain. Thankful that your, a week of your life is gone? Wow, that's serious. Hmm? Some kind of serious delusion. <laughs> okay. Uh, some people uh, say that that's why people go shopping on the weekends. They wasted a whole week of their life, and then they feel that they deserve a reward. So they go out and buy stuff. Interesting, you know, idea. Um, but the idea is that if we're not aware, if we're not mindful of each present moment, we miss it. Hmm? We're not paying attention. We're not tuned in. Then our life goes by moment to moment, and we missed it. And that moment is gone. It will never come again. And we, in our ignorance, missed it because we weren't paying attention. You see? So when we learn to pay attention of each present moment, then we live fully. We can live fully appreciating each person we meet, hmm? each flower that falls in front of us. Uh, even we can appreciate our work experience in a whole new way. Right? So that's why Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese monk, has a book called Present Moment, Wonderful Moment. Yeah. Um, I use his books in my Buddhist thought and culture classes at the university. And there's one passage in Peace is Every Step that's so lovely. He talks about being a four-year-old boy in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And his mom comes back from the market, and she brought him a cookie. So the little boy takes the cookie and goes out into the front yard with his dog. And he spends 45 minutes eating his cookie. So beautiful. Hmm? A four-year-old kid enjoying a cookie for 45 minutes. Wow. Must have had some good imprints from past lifetimes. <laughs> OK, so next we can develop insight. When we're paying attention to what's going on around us, we can develop insight into what they call the three marks of existence, right? Trilakshana. What are the three marks of existence? I know you're just dying to know. You probably already know. It's the unsatisfactory nature of phenomena. 
the impermanent nature of phenomena and the no-self, insubstantial nature of phenomena. Okay? So that's what we want to gain insight into. Dukkha, anicca, anatta. Hmm? So third, we develop patience and acceptance. When we're really tuned in to the moment, our mind is spacious, it's open, it's completely present to the moment. Therefore, we can be much more patient with all life's little annoyances. Mm, they're endless. And our natural tendency, because of our bad habits, is to get upset over all those little annoying things and annoying people. <clears throat> and yet, when we practice mindfulness, we become much better, much more patient at dealing with people. Mm? And even if they are really annoying, you know, we don't have to react. We don't have to respond. Why would we do that? Then we're the loser, right? So that's pointless. Why not just be there in the moment? Maybe listen to their story. Hmm? It's, it's amazing how it transforms situations uh, when we are completely patient and accepting. Fourth, we develop clarity of mind. This is wonderful, too. Um, so much of the time, our minds are muddled, especially these days when we're all trying to multitask. Mm, we think we're being so clever, <laughs> eating and checking our email and listening to the news and you know doing four or five things at once. But actually, the research shows that that makes us much less effective. Multitasking is simply inefficient. So, in this case, um, we want to develop clarity of mind. All of those distractions actually muddle our mind so that we don't work as effectively. We don't study as effectively. We don't interact with our fellow sentient beings as effectively. So by practicing mindfulness, our mind becomes clearer and clearer. We can do everything better. Hmm? Next, less stress. Okay, so mindfulness is the ultimate de-stress. Hmm? You don't have to pay to go to a yoga studio, though yoga can help a lot, right? It's actually, I think, a really good stage on the path. It's kind of complementary to meditation because it helps us to focus, or well, unwind, for one thing, and focus on the body. Um, and also, mindfulness practice takes it another step further in learning to deal with stress and ultimately get rid of it altogether, which is very healthy, by the way, very healthful. More joy in our life, right? Well, naturally, once we get free from reacting to all the disturbances and annoyances and disappointments of life, of course we're going to be happier. It, it makes perfect sense. Hmm? And of course that brings greater inner peace. Um, and yeah, so then we're a happy camper, right? And the people around us also. It's not just for our own benefit. It's also for the benefit of our families, our Dharma Center members, people in our workplace, everyone that we have to deal with mm -hmm. throughout the day. And ultimately, we can even become a Buddha. Though, according to the Buddhist teachings, mindfulness alone is not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, mindfulness, now, this raises the question of how does mindfulness differ from meditation? Any ideas? Well, I would say that mindfulness can be practiced in meditation and also in the post-meditation period. So when we're meditating, we're mindful of our object of meditation. And then in the post-meditative session, we're mindful of everything that's going on around us. Okay, now that's more difficult. It's more difficult, actually, to maintain mindfulness after the meditation session because there's just so much going on, right? There's the traffic, there's the 
you know, the lights, the, all the noises. You're very fortunate to be in this lovely setting. There's very little noise. Hmm? Just the air conditioner. But that's quite peaceful. You hardly hear the traffic. That's great. So you've got a perfect place for meditating. Very fortunate. Um, so, but normally we sit in formal meditation uh, because we have fewer distractions. Then we only have to deal with the distractions of the mind, not so much the outside stuff. So it's all well and good. People say, oh, well, you know, yeah, I'm meditating all the time. I don't have to sit because, hey, you know, meditation in action. Okay, okay, right. I get it, but you know what? If we're honest, it's not that easy. It's not that easy to maintain mindfulness in all of the clutter of everyday life. Mm -hmm. So I think that, yes, mindfulness is fantastic because it brings meditation off the cushion into every moment of everyday life. But the formal sitting meditation is also essential. We'll never be able to be mindful of all the f phenomena of the busy lifestyle that we li live today unless we do formal sitting meditation. I'm not sure it's possible. So, now, this is not the only type of meditation. Clearly, there are other kinds of meditation, and one very popular one is the four Brahma Viharas, mm -hmm. translated as the four divine abodes, or sometimes translated as the four immeasurables. And it's explained that way in the Pali text, too. The, in Tibetan, they translate it as the four immeasurables, uh, and they didn't make that up. It's also in the original Sanskrit and Pali. So what are the four divine abodes, or four Brahma Viharas? Um, compassion, loving kindness, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. So let's unpack those one by one. What do we mean by these wonderful, wonderful terms? Well. Compassion means, may all beings be free from suffering. So we actually meditate on this. We meditate on freeing all beings from suffering. And it creates such a wonderful mind state. Mm -hmm. to f imagine all beings free from suffering. It's also a great antidote to any kind of hatred that we might feel. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we might have shall I say, harmful thoughts to others when they don't uh, do as we like. Hmm? We're all nice little people as long as everything goes our way. But the minute somebody crosses us, we might have some uh, un yeah, harmful thoughts toward them. Well, this is a perfect antidote. Hmm? It's wishing that all beings be free from suffering. Now, how does that differ from loving kindness? Well. Loving kindness is the corollary. May all beings be happy. So sending loving kindness out to the world, right? Metta is the wish that all beings, large and small, near and far, visible and invisible, may all beings be happy, right? So it's not just people. It's not just our own family. It's expanded far beyond that. And the further we can expand it, the greater our loving kindness is. It grows. It grows as we do this meditation practice. Um, so this is a perfect antidote to anger, for example. Right? May all beings be happy. The third one is sympathetic joy. This means rejoicing in the qualities and good fortune of others. This is the perfect antidote to jealousy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when people get, you know, the higher marks in school, they're better at meditation. They get the new car. They get the promotion. Then we feel this little niggly, nagly 
very unpleasant sensation. Ooh, what is that? Well, if we're honest, it's jealousy, right? And this meditation practices the direct antidote to jealousy by rejoicing in the good qualities and good fortune of others. Then we don't have to suffer that unpleasant sensation anymore. It's a wonderful practice. Hmm? And certainly worth um, doing in the workplace, for example. Mm -hmm. And the fourth one is equanimity. As we practice these Brahma Viharas, we learn to become calm and even tempered in all situations. Now, one way to do this is to practice the four Brahma Viharas with all living beings, imagining all of them equal. Uh, normally, we have lots of loving kindness to our friends and our families and to those who benefit us. Mm -hmm. But we don't have that same kind of loving feeling toward our so-called enemies, the people who harm us, the people who stand in our way, uh, the people who abuse us or cheat us, right? But in this meditation, we try to equalize our feelings of compassion, loving kindness, sympathetic joy to all living beings equally. Mm. And of course, in the Mahayana tradition, they'll take it further by imagining all sentient beings as having been our loving mothers in past lives. This is the trope. It could be the loving father, but in the text, it actually says, our loving mother, motherly sentient beings. Mm -hmm. And they describe the love of the mother in great detail. Uh, how our mothers carry us in their womb for nine or ten months, um, despite all the inconveniences, having to worry about what they eat and what they drink and how quickly they move and how they roll over. I mean, it's just, you know, amazing. And then they give birth to us with great pain. And then they look after us when we're helpless little beings that would never survive on their own. And then they teach us to walk, teach us to talk, teach us to eat, teach us how to get along in society, and so forth. So the kindness of the loving mother is the model. Of course, this doesn't always work for everyone. Um, in the in North America and Western countries, sometimes people don't have a very happy relationship with their parents. So remember, the Tibetan lamas used to come to the states and teach, you know, oh, treat all living beings as your kind mother. And then the students would come and say, I hate my mother. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and the lamas were so shocked; they'd never heard of such a thing, right? And it was just, I mean, but then they listen to the stories, and yeah, it, it can happen that, you know, mothers are also human beings. Sometimes they make mistakes. And so, in any case, if that's the case, we can take whoever is the most loving person in our, in our life and use that as the model. For most people, it would be the mother, despite the mistakes because of their great kindness in giving birth to us. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. And then we wouldn't have the opportunity for awakening, right? So, and this is personified in the Mahayana tradition as Avalokiteshvara, um, who is said to be the embodiment of all the Buddha's compassion. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you know that in India, Avalokiteshvara is male, right? Mm -hmm. huh? And according to the recent research of uh, Yu Jinfang, he's done a big 600-page book on Kuan Yin, it turns out that Avalokiteshvara was male in China too up until the 12th century. I was amazed to find that. So she didn't do her sex change right away. <laughs> it took many centuries for Avalokiteshvara to manifest as Kuan Yin in female form. Uh, and that Madonna-like form may have had you know, Greek influence too, or even Roman 
with the, especially when she appears with the child. It looks like the Madonna, the mother of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So, just interesting. Now, we can also note the various different cultural variations of meditation. Um, the one that we started out with, mindfulness of breathing, in Pali is anapanasati. Right? Sati means mindful, anapana means breath. So mindful of the breath. I think this meditation is really, really helpful. When I was in the hospital with snake bite for three months, this is what really I found so amazingly helpful, to be able to stay with the breathing. It took my attention off the pain, and just by placing it on the breathing, it was so soothing, so relaxing. And the other um, benefit of this practice is that it has no religious content at, at all. Everyone breathes. So our Muslim friends can do it, our Hindu friends can do it, our Christian friends can, can do this practice. By the way, some of my best students at the University of San Diego are Muslim. Yeah, two of them even stopped drinking after taking the Buddhism <laughs> class. I was so proud of them. Yes. So, um, <laughs> okay. Um, the next variety is Chan meditation, very popular in, the, in China, and then transmitted to Korea, where it becomes Sun, Japan, where it becomes Zen, and Vietnam, where it becomes Tian. Mm -hmm. And the point here is to develop direct insight into the true nature of the mind, just exactly the practice we were doing this morning. Uh, but uh, even Chan has many cultural forms. You have the Sudden Enlightenment School, the Gradual Enlightenment School, um, and then you have you know, quick walking, slow walking, um, and then you have um, the further development in Japan, no reliance on words and concepts, throw away the books, you know, throw away the Buddha, <laughs> all this sort of um, a kind of... Um, unconventional approach, meaning do away with all the props, all our typical props. Now these days it's all the devices, electronic devices. I'd like to congratulate all of you. I, have, I don't see anyone checking their email. Very good, very good. Yeah, sometimes you know, you're sitting teaching meditation, you know, <laughs> they got it hidden, right? <laughs> checking their email or their Facebook or Line or whatever is what's up. <laughs> so the next one is the Pure Land School. And as I mentioned originally, it was a, con a contemplation practice, practi practicing contemplation on the form of Amitabha, Amitabha red in color. Um, and in the Western Pure Land, and then it's given rise to the Pure Land practice that we see so popular today of chanting the name of Amitabha. Now, using sound as the object of meditation is also very skillful, I find. Uh, in the West, they sort of play down this practice. Sometimes they, they don't understand the value of chanting practices. In fact, some regard it as somehow inferior to chant or more intellectual approaches to Buddhism. But I have a great appreciation for Pure Land practice, and I've participated in many Pure Land uh, Dharma events, hmm? and where for days sometimes in Taiwan, uh, people gather at the temples and, and chant for hours, and often combined with uh, walking meditation. And I think that it's a brilliant practice because when we're focused on the name of Amitabha, our mind cannot be distracted by other things, right? We have to concentrate. Um, and of course, that's the beauty of walking meditation practice too. We have to focus or we'll fall down. So these are techniques that all help. And I don't think they're in conflict. Um, Chinese society sees that there's really no conflict. Many monasteries practice both 
procurement and SIN. And the, some are more uh, inclined to the Chan practice, um, and others are more inclined to the Amitabha practice, and many do both. The monastery where I stayed, we did both. So I think that's completely possible. Actually, I think it's very good. Um, the last one here is Vajrayana practice, which can also be called Mantrayana or Tantrayana, or just Tantra. And this is also known as deity yoga. It's an unfortunate translation because these are not worldly deities. They're actually Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. In this kind of meditation practice, we use the form of the Buddha or the Bodhisattva as the focus of our meditation. Uh, normally, we'd be introduced to this practice in an empowerment uh, so that it's said to be in an uh, unbroken lineage from the time of the Buddha himself. Um, hard to verify, of course, but that's the tradition. And then we would begin by focusing on the image of the Buddha or Bodhisattva in the space in front of us. And then eventually, which anyone can do, by the way. You don't have to have an empowerment to do that kind of visualization practice. So you can use the image of Buddha Shakyamuni or the image of Amitabha, or the image of Medicine Buddha, or any Buddha in the space in front of you. Then in this Vajrayana practice, what they do is to visualize the Buddha or Bodhisattva in uh, detail. Detail down to every hair of the eyebrow. Mm. And then next you shrink it to the size of a thumbnail with all the details. Mm -hmm. So, and you bring the Buddha or the Bodhisattva the top, to the top of your head, looking outward, and then you merge with the Buddha or Bodhisattva. In other words, you become that Buddha or Bodhisattva. You become one with the Buddha or Bodhisattva, including all the qualities of that Buddha or Bodhisattva. For example, we mentioned Avalokiteshvara being the embodiment of all the Buddha's compassion. So when we merge with the form or with Avalokiteshvara, then we ourselves become the embodiments of compassion. Or if we are doing the practice of Manjushri, for example, who embodies all the wisdom of the Buddhas, then we become the embodiment of all the Buddha's wisdom. Okay, and this practice is supposed to be done 24-7, 24, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So you eat, breathe, and sleep Manjushri, or Avalokiteshvara, or Tara, or whoever the object of your practice is. Hmm? And it, you can do various Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So to never be separated from that Buddha or Bodhisattva is the goal. So it's not easy, but also very effective practice for embodying these enlightened qualities. So now this is the calligraphy of Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese monk I mentioned. Mindfulness is a source of happiness. Hmm? And here's a mindfulness workshop in Saigon. Wow, Vietnam. And who are the meditators? Well, they would be Catholic nuns. So this illustrates how the practice of mindfulness has really spread. Uh, not just mindfulness, but many forms of meditation have spread, especially in the Catholic community. I've been to many Catholic nunneries where the nuns practice Zen, Zazen every morning. Mm -hmm. And they don't find any conflict with their uh, Catholic mm, convictions, their, their dedication to their faith. I even have one very good friend, Sister Malia. She's a Catholic nun. She's a Dominican. Um, she wears the penguin outfit, yeah, white. I told her I could never last five minutes in your order to stay so, so clean. 
Yeah, on this one it absorbs the uh, <laughs> spills. <laughs> no mindfulness at all. And um, she's been ordained the same length of time as I have, 40 years. And we're like the sister act in Honolulu. We go everywhere together. <laughs> and so she has taken refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha. And she's also taken bodhisattva vows. And she's a faithful Catholic nun. And she's done many meditation courses. Mm -hmm. So here's an example of someone who practices, they're calling it these days, dual belonging. Dual belonging. <laughs> and, and in truth, in mindfulness meditation, you don't have to give up anything. You can continue to be a Hindu or Muslim or whatnot and also practice mindfulness or secular. So. Um, now, we're okay with the time? Okay, good. So then let me introduce mindful eating. Um, being aware of our eating and how it affects our health, our state of mind, and also our environment. Our food choices affect our environment. So I probably don't have to say much, too much about vegetarianism here in Hong Kong. Many times I've asked, are you a Buddhist? Oh, yes, I've been a vegetarian for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> right? As if to be a Buddhist is to be a vegetarian, whereas we know that, well, the Buddha wasn't a vegetarian. Eh? The Buddha ate whatever people gave him. I know that comes as a shock to many Chinese Buddhists. Um, in fact, the when they went to translate that the Buddha died from eating bad pork, they translated it to mushrooms. <laughs> they just couldn't, couldn't get the idea that the Buddha ate meat. And <laughs> so, but we also know that, that meat eating does have a very serious impact on the environment. Hmm? Um, it takes 20 acres of land to grow one pound of beef, and that same 20 acres can grow a ton of soybeans. So here I'm going to show you some pictures of polar bears. <laughs> because um, now with, um, with McDonald's and all that, there's hardly any rainforest left. And not only that, but the impact on the environment overall, uh, including all of the biogases and all of that stuff that I'm not too good with, has meant global climate change, which is a kind of a euphemism for global warming. So these polar bears, I just got carried away because they're so cute. Mm -hmm. And I get all these messages every day to save the baby polar bears. <laughs> and I click, yes. <laughs> and I mean, they're so adorable, yeah? And funny. <laughs> Sometimes a little bit lazy. <laughs> but they're also having trouble coping with global warming because their habitat has been seriously eroded. And now with the snows melting, sometimes they, you know, they can't, they're having trouble adapting and finding food. And sometimes they get stranded on ice, um, and it's really serious. So they're the only one species. Every week, 60 species go extinct. We got a problem. See how skinny they're getting. And sometimes they get totally stranded. And sometimes they also get killed for sport. Can you believe? So sad. So of course there are many protests today. And there's a big one in the scientists, I think it's today, yeah. Three million scientists are marching around the world to protest. Um, global warming and the misuse of science, eh? 
So back to mindful eating. <laughs> After too many former parents, um, there are many books now being written on the idea of mindful eating. So using our two or three meals a day, whatever is your preference, maybe four. I remember one time I was staying in Happy Valley at Tokelin Cook in 1982, and the nuns were so punctual. Six o'clock, 12 o'clock, six o'clock, they eat just right on time every time. And I said, you folks are amazing. You eat three meals so regularly every day. They said, no, four. <laughs> So they also had noodles at night, a little snack. So, very cute. Okay, so here's a popular book, Mindful Eating for Dummies. And lots of little reminders. The average American gains 10 pounds between Thanksgiving and New Year's. <laughs> and then they spend the rest of the year trying to get rid of it. So sad. Then, one of my favorite signs, you often see this in Burma, be kind to animals by not eating them. <laughs> in the United States, there's, on Thanksgiving, every family has a turkey. So 20 million turkeys are slaughtered every year. So, so this is the cycle of, you know, why do I eat? When do I eat? What do I eat? How do I eat? How much do I eat? And then, how do I invest my energies? Where do I invest my energies? So, mindful eating practice reminds us that we have choices. <laughs> hmm, right? And to eat healthier foods. Of course, this is a Western slide in Chinese tradition. You'll have different options. but. The idea is to concentrate on our food, hmm? using every mouthful as a mindfulness practice instead of multitasking. Hmm? Now, often we eat at the speed of light, and we didn't even notice what we were eating, so we have to have more, and then more, and then more. Whereas if we slow down a bit and we're more mindful of every taste, hmm? every bite, then we're really in touch with our food, then we're satisfied. We can be content. Now here the definition of mindfulness is a mental state achieved by focusing one's awareness on the present moment while calmly acknowledging and accepting one's feelings, thoughts, and bodily sensations. So. The slide again somehow got in there. Mindfulness is a source of happiness. And the last slide, which is an image of Tara. So lest we think that all enlightened beings are male, we also have some female enlightened beings, such as Tara. And it's amazing to realize that many uh, monasteries throughout the Himalayan region, all the way up to Mongolia and Bhutan and Russia and so forth, all are monks doing practices on a female form of enlightenment. That's Tara. And they recite the 21 verses of Tara, uh, remembering the 21 different aspects of Tara and different colors with different, you know, paraphernalia in their hands, different gestures, different qualities, say. Eh? And um, white Tara is for long life. So if we are a Dharma practitioner, we want to live a long life, hopefully a long healthy life, and therefore Tara will help to protect the life of practitioners. If we're a butcher on the other hand, kill, 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 then short life is okay. <laughs> but Dharma practitioners, we like to live a long life, give us a better chance at enlightenment. So maybe you've got some questions. Or clarify some doubts. Shamatha is the method, and samadhi is the goal. So you practice shamatha, calm abiding on the object, and the result, the end result, is samadhi. That you gain 
the ability to focus the mind single-pointedly on the object. So in a sense, it's a goal. It's the end goal of the practice, is samadhi. And as I mentioned, once you have achieved samadhi, Through the practice of samadhi. Okay, then you achieve samadhi, um, and when you can when you've achieved samadhi, it means that you can focus your mind on the object for 20 minutes and as long as, with no distractions. And once you're able to do that, you can focus on the object as long as you like, for days together, okay. without moving. Yes? Is a samadhi a necessary condition for the meditation of the nature of the mind? Ah, good question. Okay, well, um, samadhi is not necessary for meditation on the mind because we did it this morning, right? And most of us don't have samadhi yet, but we were able to try to focus on the nature of the mind itself. Now. We also had a little bit of difficulty because sometimes our mind would wander. If we had achieved samadhi, then we could focus single-pointedly with mind as the object of our practice, and we would have been able to go more deeply into understanding the true nature of the mind. So that's where samadhi comes in handy. Once we can focus without distractions, then we can go, go more deeply or higher, whichever, you know. Once I was uh, meditating at a monastery in Kyoto, Daitokuji, I actually began in Zen. And um, we had to go for an interview with the master, the Zen master. His name was Kobori Roshi, and he was a great master. Also began the Japanese Buddhist Friendship Association, which led to repairing the temples of China in the 1970s when he started taking groups of Japanese pilgrims to, to China to visit the roots of their traditions. Oops, <laughs> nothing there. So the government got together and rebuilt so many monasteries, often with Japanese assistance, monetary assistance. So I went in for my interview with Kabori Roshi. And um, I. By bad luck, I went in with Victor Hori, who teaches uh, Buddhism at McGill University in Montreal, and he's fluent in, in Japanese. So we had to speak Japanese. So he f passes his interview with flying colors, you know. Then comes my turn. And the, they ask the usual questions, you know, how old are you, what's your name, what studies have you done, and so forth. And then he pops the question, so why do you want to practice sasa? Hmm. So I said, well, I want to deepen my awareness. And he said, well, why do you want to deepen your awareness? Well, I want to raise my consciousness. And he says, OK, so which one is it? You want to deepen it or raise it? <laughs> Dismissed. <laughs> so it was really a wake-up moment. Hmm? Right. Showing, actually, in a great Zen tradition, the limitations of language. Mm -hmm. The limitations of language, and they will go further, I think, as they do in all traditions, that awakening is beyond thoughts as well. It's beyond words and concepts. Right? That's a staple of Zen practice, beyond words and concepts. But it makes sense because, of course, the experience of awakening is beyond words and concepts. It has to be. At the same time, words and concepts are very useful, very helpful, so we know where we're going on the path. And, and sometimes, you know, with this just sitting approach to meditation, people may sit for 20 years and not really know where they're going. So words and concepts are quite useful. I watched a video recently about an interview with the Mahayana master. He, 
he ate only two meals a day. And he said, um, if we do not consume energy, body energy in our wasteful thoughts, wasteful thoughts, uh, Wang Shang, uh, we only need 5% of the intake of food we eat every day for our daily activities. Could you comment on his words, please? Hmm. Well, I think it's beautifully spoken. Um, I'm not sure how he arrived at 5%. 5% sounds a little bit small to me. I mean, but certainly I think that we would only need to eat less. Um, and certainly our wasteful thoughts, our, the kleshas, do consume a lot of our energy. And we can, we can experience this. We can verify this through our own experience. Once we practice, as we practice, and our conflicting emotions have less power on us, it frees up so much energy that we can use for other things, more productive things, more beneficial things. Right, so I totally agree with that. But the 5%, I'd, I'd have to see the research. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Hey. If there's nothing more, we could meditate. Shall we end with a meditation? I mean, this session, <laughs> before lunch. Let's do the meditation on breathing again so that we really feel that we have mastered the technique. We know exactly what to do when we sit down on the cushion. One practice at least. Sure that there's no tension in our bodies. Check the shoulder, shoulders and the abdomen area especially because we often stash tension in these places. Completely relaxed. And then relax the mind as well. And then we turn our awareness to our breathing. Mindful of the breath as it flows out and as it flows in. No need to make the breath longer or shorter, faster or slower. Simply observe the natural flow of your own breathing.
let the thoughts float away and come back to your object of meditation, which is the breath. Become completely one with your breathing. If you find it difficult to concentrate the mind, then you can try counting the breaths. In this method, we attach a number to each out-breath. The in-breath will come naturally. So we think one, in, two, in, Three, in, counting from one to ten, or it can be one to twenty-one. Start again from one. If we lose count, we get up to thirteen, fourteen, or we forget our number, it's okay, no worries. Just start again from one. So let's do this for a few more minutes. Hmm? See if you can do three cycles of ten. So now we'll break for lunch. I'd like you to keep in mind what we've been discussing.